global income inequality. And this is very, very important. Um, I've put up here some general statistics which don't come from UNCTAD, but which are uh, very important in terms of explaining what the magnitude of global income inequality is at the moment. Key number, the poorest 40% of the world population has 5% of the world income. The poorest 40% of the world population has 5% of the world income. Okay? You can get other numbers from these. The richest 1% of the people receive as much as the bottom 57%. Take that home with you. Take that home and tell people over dinner. Okay? Less than 50 million richest people receive as many as 2.7 2 million poor people. Okay? It's a big number. Take it home. Okay? This is just becoming visible because people are starting to measure global income inequality. This is very important as well. Inter-country inequality weighted by population accounts for 70% or more of global inequality. Inter-country inequality. <coughs> so global inequality is taking the inequalities between all people everywhere, inter-country, within country. 70% is due to inter-country. Okay, that's the magnitude. How do we explain that? Is it a bad thing? Is that bad? Is that a problem? Is that a problem? There's an inequality. I've noticed an inequality here. There's a hair inequality. I've got the most hair. He's got the middle hair. He's got the least hair. Okay? Okay? So there's a hair inequality here. Is that a problem? Do we need to intervene to correct that major inequality? It's a, you know... He's you know how to do it, let me know. Okay. He's, he's got 0% of the hair. Is that a problem? Yeah? I'm just in between. Okay, and you, he's the middle rank. He's in the middle class, if you like. <laughs> this thing called global income inequality is basically invisible as a global issue. It is invisible as a global issue. And one of the key questions is why is it so invisible? Why is it so invisible? And for me, that's a major problem. My own organization has done some work on it, but not as much as it should have done. One of its most important um, contributions was the 1997 Trade and Development Report, which basically was writing in 1997, and it identified certain key trends at that point in time, which I think are still relevant today. It's like reading something from 2012, uh, this document. I, I, I also worked on it, but it's a, it's a very, very important document, I think. And it showed rising income back gaps between the North and the South, increasing income inequality within countries, and a hollowing out of the middle class, which has occurred in many countries. And then it identified certain key trends which it related to liberalization and rapid lib liberalization. So there was growing wage inequality between skilled and unskilled workers. Um, capital everywhere was gaining in comparison with labor. And a new rentier class has emerged worldwide with financial liberalization, the substantial expansion of international capital flows, and the rise of public and private debt. So this, these are the key trends identified then. But the other thing which I think was even more or as important was these bow ties. I call these bow ties. What these measure is this is the share of the national income in Tanzania of the richest 20%, the middle 40%, and the bottom 40%. And what you see is in Tanzania, in Venezuela, in Thailand, in Panama, around the same time, which was like the late 70s and early 80s, the trend in national income distribution shifts. And what happens is before that point in time, generally, the middle 40%, if we go to Thailand, the middle 40% share was going up the top 20% share was going down. 
And then around the mid-70s, you get an inflection. What happens to the bottom 40% varies. So you get vicious bow ties. For example, in Tanzania, where the bottom 40% share drops. But in other cases, it's just, you know, it's kind of benign. But what is happening in all these cases is that the, the middle, the top 20% is going, its share is going up, the middle 40% is going down. Now what's significant of that is it all happens in different countries at the same time. How do you get synchronic bow ties? How can you get these synchronic bow ties? Well, the way you get it is that all these countries must, these trends must be due in some sense to global factors as well as national factors. Now since that point in time, UNCTAD has not done a single report on global inequality. This is kind of, for me, it's astounding. Um, it's actually doing one this year. So if you look at the trade and development report this year, it's doing it. But it does within the organization, it has a, a division working on least developed countries. And that's where I was working. Now the least developed countries is a set of um, 49, 50 countries um, which are identified by the UN as least developed in the sense that they have a very low income per capita, they have very weak human assets, and they have very high levels of economic vulnerability. Okay? And they're generally also, there's a population criteria, so that they're small, low-income countries with very weak human resources and very high levels of economic vulnerability. Now, the UN position is that these countries are specially um, uh, structurally weak and they're going to fall behind unless there are special measures undertaken for them. They will become like a kind of underclass of countries which will be marginalized in the global economy. Now is that happening? Well, if you look at the long-term growth performance, you in fact what you see is, um, and this is one scale on this side, this is the LDCs, this is just GDP per capita from 1980 to 2008, it's gone up from 500 to, I don't know, four, I don't know 400 to 400 and 480. The dotted line at the top is the uh, developed countries, which have gone up from about 17,000 to 25,000, <laughs> okay? So these guys at the bottom have gone from 300, they're going up, they're actually booming. They've been booming in the 2000s. But what does the boom mean? They're going up. They're almost their average uh, GDP per capita. This is an exchange rate. It hasn't been adjusted for, for purchasing power parity. But yes, they are, in some sense, being left behind. The middle one is the other developing countries. I think the important point is that an effect of this uh, situation is that poverty reduction is very slow in these LDCs. This is showing what the, the picture of poverty reduction, uh, this is the share of the population living on less than 125 per day. So a consequence of this inequality, consequence of the, the di global distribution of income is that you've got very high levels of poverty. What's interesting in this pattern is that you look at the share of the population living in extreme poverty. It actually increased till 94, okay? So there's a kind of key point, and then it starts decreasing. But it de decreases very, very slowly, and then it's accelerating more in the 90s, okay, going down more. But it's still off track to what the MDG poverty goal is. And in fact, because of the population growth rates, then what this implies is that the numbers of people ex living in extreme poverty are actually um, increasing. Now, an, an effect of this for the LDCs is that the share of the population living in extreme poverty in the world in LDCs is increasing. So, these are estimates we made 
which shows that in 1990, 18% of the extremely poor people in the world lived in LDCs. And over time, at that point in time, 60% was in China and India. This is China and India. Um, what our numbers are showing is that in 2007, 36% are in LDCs, gone up from 18% to 36%. What you see from this is that by 2020, the LDCs will probably become the um, major locus of extreme poverty in the global economy. Now these poverty numbers, there are different ways of interpreting them, but I think this number here, some people say about 50% of the global extreme poor is in China and India. What we've got is about 42%, which is basically uh, because of a difference in terms of India rather than China. But the trend, I think, is, is an important one. Why is this happening? Now, the reason you get this kind of increasing poverty and a, a reflection of this kind of global um, in inequality in the global income distribution is, is that jobs are not being created there. Not sufficient jobs are being created there. Now, what these numbers show is how many new entrants to the labor force are coming in in Mali and Madagascar, which are two LDCs. Okay. So, in 2005, there were 172,000 people who were new entrants to the labor force. This is, you, you calculate this based on demographics. Okay? Now, what that means is, if you want to reduce poverty, you've got to create 172,000 productive jobs and livelihoods. Okay? It can be in agriculture, it can be industry, it can be services, but you've got to create productive jobs and livelihoods. 172,000 of them in Mali. Okay? Now, the thing about it is the demographics are such that you've got to create more each year, more each year, more each year. Okay? So, by this is going to peak in 2045 when 447,000 new entrants to the labor force. So we're in 2012 now, so maybe in 2012 there were maybe 200,000 new entrants to the labor force, okay? So to reduce poverty, you've got to do that. Now, um, we live in a world with these inequalities, but the point about it is you can't move. How are these Malians going to get, okay, they can't get their jobs there. Okay, let them move out, okay? Where are they going? Maybe, you know, come to Europe, okay? But no, 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 you can't move, okay? But this is the other part of the challenge. You can imagine if a country has a very, very small income per capita, the question then is, how much money does it have to run its government? Okay? If you've got a very, very low income per capita, how much money do you have to run your government? So these are the numbers, okay? So the average, this is 2009, the average GDP per capita of an LDC was one point five nine dollars per day that's the GDP per capita for a very very poor country okay household consumption expenditure is one dollar fourteen cents per day okay now none of these has been adjusted for purchasing power parity but what you get from that is you've got 45 cents per person per day is the difference between the consumption and the GDP per capita. Now that is, those 45 cents per person per day is what an average LDC has for investment and for running its government. Investment, private investment, public investment, <laughs> running the government, paying its school teachers, paying its nurses, paying its judges, paying its accountants. This is how much it's got, 45 cents per se. But that's both for running the government and for investment. Now, how much are they paying? Uh, what happens, what are they doing is they're actually spending 20 cents per person per day. In advanced countries, we're paying $20 per person per day on this thing called government final consumption expenditure, which is the wages and salaries of all government workers and purchases of goods and services. This is no public investment. This isn't building infrastructure. This is just running your government. This is just running your government. Giving pencils to the kids in the school. Okay? You've got 20 cents per person per day. So the issue is, 
in this level of inequality, given these countries are so poor, what kind of governance do you have? They've got to create, they've got to create, a country like Mali has got to create 180,000, 200,000 productive jobs and livelihoods every year in order that people, in order to reduce poverty. They're already, you know, the poverty rates are sky high at the moment. They've got this governance situation where they've got very, very little money. And they are totally integrated into the world economy. They're integrated into the world economy through commodity flows, through value chains. So what are we going to do about it? What the international community has been doing about it, should it do something about it? Let's leave it like that. And if it should, what should it do? You know? Are we focusing on the right things? Should we talk about LDCs? You know, the, the donor community has started to talk more about fragile states rather than the UN's category of least developed countries. Okay? So there's a whole series of issues there.